you know, it continues to be a shock when the little thing stops spinning around and I'm actually here. I'm Becky Goldsmith. Thank you very much for joining me for Time Out on this very fine Wednesday afternoon. Behind me, I'm going to click the little button to go here so you can see behind me. Wait, I have to go the other way. Behind me is a quilt that I almost never put up um, here because it is so red. But because I hardly ever get to show it, I thought I would show it. This is Pushing Boundaries. Uh, it is an e-pattern only. It has never been in a book. It's never been in print. But it's one of my favorite newer quilts. It's, uh, it's fun. I hand applique it, but you could machine applique it. All right, so today we're talking about three different ways to make templates pretty much for hand applique, although you could use these to make templates for other things, and I'm sure you'll sort that out. I've got a series of videos, um, and I will be back and forth in between the videos. And I'm really live this week. You know, last week I was on vacation. The stars in South Texas were amazing, but I'm here now. <laughs> the stars are less amazing. All right, here we go. When you want to make templates that begin by printing something in your printer so that you don't have to trace it, there are three ways to do it that I know of. One is to print your, your templates onto the paper that's in your copier already and cover it with a peel and stick laminate. This is the method I use almost all the time. Another way to do it is to use the quilter's freezer paper that comes in eight and a half by 11 sheets that you can run through an inkjet printer and print your template shapes onto it. And then there's this made by Cutright. It is a heavy duty freezer paper. It says it's heavy as cardstock, and it is about as heavy as a regular weight cardstock. This too can run through an inkjet printer. Never, never a laser printer. Any of you who have fused freezer paper to the drum of a laser printer, you know what I mean. Not that. Inkjet only. Each of these products does indeed provide you with a template. But they are templates that you might use in different ways in different times for different things. Let me make one template in each of these methods and then show you how each one might be used to the best of its ability. Because I think what's true is there will be times when one or another of these kinds of templates is really handy and other times when they're not particularly handy at all. All right, let me make templates. Okay, I'm back. <clears throat> and as I said, I typically, well, I always make templates from a copy when I can because tracing onto things is slow and not particularly accurate. And you'll notice I did not include template plastic in here at all. You know, the kind that comes in the sheet, it's a little bit thick. I never use template plastic because number one, you have to trace on it. And number two, it's really hard on your fingers when you cut it out. So you won't see me using that ever. I can't remember when I bought template plastic last. But I want to show you, for, the, for those of you who may not have ever seen me make templates with the peel and stick laminate, I've got a really quick video to show you how you do it. I'm guessing that many of you have seen me make templates from a paper copy using the peel and stick laminate in the past. But I'll quickly show you how to do it here. I'm trimming away the excess paper because anything here that isn't a template is trash. This is a single-sided piece of peel and stick laminate. I sell it on my website, but you can find it at office supply stores as well. 
This is the end that's easy to peel. Once you peel it back, crease the backing sheet so it doesn't flop over. If I was going to need this whole piece of laminate, I'd peel that off, but I don't. I'm going to turn my trimmed copy right side down, cup it in the center, and I will lay it down on the laminate and then slowly control it as it flattens out. Don't hold the paper too close to the laminate because the static electricity will cause it to grab the paper. I'm about five inches above the laminate. I'm going to begin moving steadily downward. Once you get on the laminate, that's it. It's stuck. Let it down. Place the backing sheet back over it just to protect your scissors from any of the sticky bits of laminate hanging off. And I'm going to trim this excess laminate away. And these pieces I can save to make small templates from sometime in the future. Pieces that are too small to save, I throw away. Once you have this trimmed so that there won't be any sticky bits hanging off, the backing sheet falls off, it too can throw away. Then I will cut out my template. For today, for this demonstration, I will cut out that Christmas tree number seven. I'll do that and be back. Okay, so I cut it out and you'll see me using these scissors kind of a lot. These are made by Kai. They're an embroidery scissor. Um, they don't always come serrated, but when I order them, they come serrated. So one blade has little teeth and the other blade does not, which is helpful, especially with fabric, kind of with paper. Um, one thing I want to show you, I, have to, I keep thinking I'm moving toward the camera when I'm not. Um, when you hold scissors in your hand, you typically, if you were me before I started holding this kind of scissors, you might put your lower index finger in the grip and have your thumb in the other grip and cut like this. That is not such a great way to hold the scissors. When you pick up scissors, <coughs> excuse me, put your index finger in front of the bottom grip and your thumb then in the top grip. This scissor, even this scissor, is really weighted in such a way that it wants you to do that. What happens is when you've got your finger in front of the lower grip, it gives you more control over the cut. You can point where you're going just a little bit better because you have pointing ability with that index finger. The other thing is that it changes the balance of the scissor in your hand. So with every scissor from here on out that you pick up, give this a try. I think you'll find that you have more control over your cutting. The other thing is, so that's how you hold the scissors, when you cut your templates, split the line. Don't cut outside the line, don't cut inside the line. Cut right down the middle of the drawn line. Because if you add or subtract width to the shape, it changes the size of your applique. All right, let me see here. I left myself notes. Next up is a video that shows how you use the kind of template I just made. This is the template I made with the peel and stick laminate and one paper copy. To use it for needle turn hand applique, I would place this template right side up on the right side of the fabric on top of a sandboard. The sandboard keeps the fabric from moving as I trace around the template. I will place the template on the diagonal grain of the fabric in this case because there's no design that needs to go up and down the tree. A bias edge turns under more gracefully than one that is on the straight of grain. 
because I'm on the sandboard, I can shift this more easily. Plus, it keeps the fabric from moving. I'm tracing around the shape with my General's Charcoal Pencil. I like this pencil anytime I need something light. Now, the positives with this kind of template are that, for one, it's really, really flat, which means that when you trace, you can get right up next to the edge of the uh, template. If you're used to using a thicker template made from template plastic, you know that getting right next to the edge of the template is harder because the template itself is taller, which moves the edge of the chalk away from the edge of the template. You do have to be sure to keep your template in place with your non-pencil holding hand. So if you watched, I've moved my fingers down the shape. And I'm, I'm pushing down pretty well to hold it in place. Now I'm going to turn this around and recheck my placement. The template will move if you're not careful because it's not glued down or ironed to the fabric. But it's flat, you can trace right up next to it. The other thing is that because the paper is on the underside of the fabric, it helps to hold it in place a little bit better. And the laminate, which is shiny and slick on top, that's nice too because the pencil glides across it. It doesn't kind of get hung up on the top of the paper that's smooth. If you're doing a kind of applique that requires you to use the template upside down on the back side of the fabric for whatever reason, if you know that's how you're going to use the templates, when you make them, put the laminate on the wrong side of the paper so that the right side is next to the fabric. It will make tracing easier. But I so rarely do that that I always put the laminate on the right side of the template because I use them most often right side up on the right side of the fabric. I hope that wasn't totally confusing. Once it's all traced, I would use my scissors and cut my shapes out adding a 3 16 inch seam allowance for the needle turn applique that I do most often. And there I would be. What I like about templates made from a paper copy and peel and stick laminate is that they are accurate because you're working from a mechanical copy. They're fast because you're not having to trace the shapes onto template plastic or anything else. They are flat which makes them easy to trace around, and they're easy to cut out. I forgot to say that in the beginning, but cutting these shapes out is just really like cutting paper. They are not hard at all on your hands. They're fast, they're accurate, they're easy to use, and they're very reusable. If I needed to make 20 of these trees, that template would hold up for me to make all 20. And that is why I almost always make templates this way. Okay, y'all y'all can see this, but the cat just, get, those of you who know Jim, there he is. He wants to be here, so here he is. Okay, <clears throat> I want to go back to the idea of using your templates right side up or wrong side up. So, the right side of the template always corresponds to the right side of the fabric. When you make your templates with the peel and stick laminate, if the paper side is next to the fabric, it stays in place better when you trace. So placing the laminate on the right side of the paper to use right side up on the fabric, that's how you want to do it. If you're going to turn it all over and you know that you're going to be tracing with the wrong side of the paper up, 
that's the side you want the laminate on so that the paper side is next to the fabric. This requires thought and it continues to require thought as you use freezer paper templates. So now I want to show you, begin walking you through the differences between the two kinds of freezer paper that are reasonable to make templates from. Here are my two kinds of freezer paper. This is the more traditional lighter weight freezer paper. This is the heavier weight cut right freezer paper and I've got templates ready to go with both. One of the things to be aware of is that anything on each of these sheets that isn't a template is trash. Now you could save this big excess area on both to use to make other templates, but because they're oddly shaped, you would not be able to run them through your printer. You could trace on them as you would regular freezer paper that comes on a roll, and this you might have more success because it's lighter weight, you could see through it. If you were going to try and trace your shapes on this, I think you'd have to have a light box underneath it. Or you do what I do and just throw away any excess and get a bigger sheet, which means that there's more waste. But really, it doesn't add up to that much waste. It just depends on how frugal you are. The thing that makes freezer paper special is that you can iron it to the fabric. If I were needing to press this to the back side of the fabric, if that's how you use freezer paper, be aware that you have to print the reverse of the templates onto the freezer paper. They'll be upside down. The numbers will be backwards so that if you press it to the back of the fabric, it's, it's the reverse. If I were to press this shape, like this, that's technically right sides up, onto the wrong side of the back, that means that this side, which is the wrong side of the shape, when I turn this over, the wrong side of the shape corresponds to the right side of the fabric. If your shape is like a circle or a hexagon, that doesn't matter. But if it's something like this, where it's not the same on both sides, that does matter. So be very aware of that when you make your copies onto whichever freezer paper product you are using. The positive that you can iron your templates to the fabric and they stay put is also a slight negative. You have to have an iron with you turned on to use these templates. I have my iron set at no steam because steam would not mix well with the paper. It would make it soft and it just wouldn't mix well. I've also got my iron set at hot because I almost always set my iron at hot when I'm using it. The packaging, neither of these packages tell you how hot to make your iron. It's possible that you could get by with a slightly cooler iron. Also, neither package tells you how long to press the freezer paper to make it stick. So that was a little bit and that's sticking pretty well. It is possible that you would need to press longer on the thicker freezer paper. Let's see. So that's about the same amount of time. And it's sticking a little less well. Let me press that a little bit more. And I suppose it would be fair to let it cool a little bit before we check that out. The first one is staying stuck really well. And the second one with the cut right, yeah, it's staying stuck plenty well enough. Okay, so for myself, 
having to use the templates always where there's an iron is a negative because I often find myself tracing when I'm sitting in the living room with my sandboard and my templates and my fabric. So you just have to play that by ear to figure out what works for you. And then the other thing is keeping in mind the, the whole right side, wrong side of the fabric thing. Be sure before you ever start making copies on the freezer paper that you know how you're going to use it so that you don't waste a bunch. And there is the waste part, but that's okay. It's not that expensive. All right. So next, I have another video that tells you more about how the templates work. If you are using these templates the way you would use a regular template, where you want to trace around it and then remove the template to sew it, you can trace next to both of these. But tracing next to the traditional paper template requires a little more care because it is so very flat that it's easy to get off and run your chalk onto the edge of the paper. The edge of this is also finer. It's just like a piece of paper. So if your intention is to reuse this multiple times, the edges of the paper could get soft and stretch and deform just a little bit. If you are going to trace next to the cut right, the taller one, that's going to be easier because it is thicker. So for tracing next to, that one is a clear winner. If your intention is to not trace at all on your fabric for whatever reason, you want to be sure that the freezer paper stays in place on your fabric while you cut it out. What kind of applique might you do this with? I do this for machine applique. I really do. If I want turned edge machine applique, I do not need that line there. I just need the edge of the applique represented by the freezer paper on the right side of the fabric. like this. And if I was preparing this for turned edge machine applique, I would first finger press those edges to the back of the applique shape. And I would do that all the way around. And you know what? That cut right is holding the fabric really well. That's very nice. And it's, it's got body. This is, this is pretty nice. And I would finger press the other side as well. But to prepare this for machine applique, and I've got more videos online that show this, uh, look on YouTube under machine applique. The way I do it is take a little tiny piece of the glue from the glue stick using a wooden cuticle stick and I would glue that down on its finger pressed fold, just like that. That's how I would prepare the edge for machine applique. When you prepare your edges for machine applique this way, what you end up with is a shape where the edges are glued down. You can pin it to your block or glue it, I suppose, if you really wanted to. It would depend on the shape. You would put this on your, on your background and you can applique it in place on the machine. Some of you might actually like to prepare your applique shapes this way for a regular hand applique stitch. I would not in my hand applique want to have the glue there, 
but if the glue doesn't bother you and you very much like having a prepared edge to sew, well, this is a decent choice. Okay, so, <laughs> so there's a lot there, right? Um, one thing I want to say about the way I use the glue for those prepared edges is that if you take your glue stick and like you run it along the seam allowance, even with the sandpaper below it, you can stretch that seam allowance and cause it to fray. And I, I don't like to do that. You can run the glue on the body of the applique, like right at the edge sort of, you know, near the edge of the freezer paper on the underside and then fold that seam allowance over on it. You know, rather than using little pieces of glue, you can do a line of glue. But again, for me, I find that that it's just too much glue. But there are a variety of ways that, um, <clears throat> that people can do that. <clears throat> the other thing is that you know, we all applique differently. So gluing down the edges before I hand applique is just not what I do that much. But if you want to, that's a good way to do it. The other thing, and it was funny as I was going through here and I was working with the two kind of freezer papers, is that the cut right is new to me. And the more traditional freezer paper I have at least used more. And I find myself kind of wanting to be loyal to the lighter weight freezer paper. But there, you know, that thicker freezer paper has a lot going for it. Okay, let me um, show you some more here. The regular weight freezer paper would be useful in the same way. And you can do exactly the same thing with this shape that you can with the heavier template. just like that. So I would finger press all the way around. And you can do the same thing as far as gluing the seam allowance under with this weight of freezer paper. Depending on how you're going to use it, one of the benefits to using the lighter weight freezer paper could be that you can see through it a little bit more. If you have a stripe that you need to match, if there's something in the fabric that it's helpful to be able to see through the freezer paper for placement, this would be better than the heavier weight, which is harder to see through. Really, the two freezer paper templates work in pretty much an identical way. The thicker one is going to be easier to trace against. The thinner one is easier to see through. If you like to use freezer paper on the underside of your applique and then you want to turn the edges around it, the lighter weight one will occupy less space on the underside of your fabric. And you don't think that's a big deal until you wrap the fabric around the shape. And the thickness of the paper, it occupies space and it also moves the folded edge to the outside of your shape. So if that's the way you're using your freezer paper, your applique shapes are always going to be just a little bit bigger than they would be otherwise. And if you're using a thicker template, it's going to be that much bigger and taller because the edge of the seam allowance has been wrapped over something thicker. Okay, so I really had to rack my brains to think about why you would want to have freezer paper on the underside of the applique, because I just don't do that. But I know some people do, so that thickness is something to consider. I would not use freezer paper for English paper piecing, I don't think. Um, I have not found a good reason to do that. Now, some of you may use it for that. 
It wouldn't move. You could iron it to the back and it wouldn't move. There's that. Uh, if I was doing that, I would think, I, you know, I'm, I'm just not sure. I, I'm just going to put it out there. You guys can give it a go if you want to. You would be able to remove it better from English paper piecing because the um, seam allowance would open it up enough for you to do that. Something else, and I can't remember if I say it in the next video or not, but if you've got a shape that you're going to trace around repeatedly, the cut right is the better choice because it's thicker and it's going to hold up better. If you've used freezer paper in the past, you know there will be a limit to how much you can reuse any one template. And I'm sure it varies between what kind of fabric you're pressing it to. Is it really fuzzy? Is it not very fuzzy? Did you pre-wash? Did you not pre-wash? How hot is your iron? There, there will be many variables, which is probably why they don't tell you exactly how many times you can use it on the packaging because they don't know. There is another reason why using freezer paper templates might be appealing and that is that the day will come probably for each of us it'll come for me I know when holding the template in place and being able to accurately trace around it will get harder either because of either because of arthritis in my fingers or because I might lose hand strength or I might have numbness in my fingers for whatever reason it could get harder to hold this in place, in which case having the template ironed to the fabric so that it won't move as I trace around it, well, that's a bonus. That's, that's one reason why. And if that was the case, I would lean toward the thicker template rather than the traditional freezer paper template. Any of you who use freezer paper regularly, now that you've seen the differences between them, I feel certain that you can sort out for yourself which one of these two weights will work best for you in whatever situation you have. Okay, so one other thing, and this is totally outside of the box, um, but I used to, back in the day in my youth, I did like dyeing of fabric and resist dyeing where you would use bleach on fabric and, you know, and I did t-shirts where I would take a shape cut out of freezer paper. And this was the older, thinner freezer paper. The cut right would be so much better. Pictures, stars, circles, whatever. I would cut these shapes out and iron them to a t-shirt and then I would have bleach in a spray bottle and I would spray it and it would take the dye out of the fabric everywhere but where these were. So I could do some really fun things. You could do the same thing with fabric paint. You could do the same thing with like acrylic paints that you've thinned. <laughs> it's kind of fun. Um, once you start thinking about that, you know, that you can use, like you could cut stars, hearts, whatever. I just have a Christmas tree. Um, you could also take the larger sheet and cut shapes out of it to make a stencil to use for all kinds of things, right? So let's say you wanted to draw hearts on your... Uh, on your quilt and you didn't have the right heart shape, you could make stencils out of this, you know, to trace to then quilt around. I think you're getting the idea. Also, I don't have one, but some of you might have a laser cutter, you know, like the, like the um, it's like a copier, but it cuts things. You could cut some stencils out of this to do fun things with. Uh, it would probably also work with those AccuCut machines, the other ones where you can cut shapes out. So I'm just pitching that out there because it, it would be a lot of fun. And for those of you who say have grandchildren that you're looking for a project or if you do fabric dyeing or fabric painting or whatever, 
it could be fun. So that is another use for this that's a little bit outside the box of what I was thinking, but it came to me. So there's that. Now, let me think, is that everything? I'm a little past my typical 30 minutes, but you know, there was a lot of there there. If you would like to suggest a topic, there's my email address. Give me an email. I am happy, happy to have topics. I think next week I'm going to talk about some simple, easy stretches that benefit us all you know, we who sew. So I think that's what I'm going to talk about next week. I'm not positive, but I think. Uh, what's the other thing? This is the other thing. I will see you next week on Wednesday at two o'clock central time, where I will be happy to take a time out with you once more. So until then, may you have many happy stitches. Thanks for watching.